but I want to say, where are the other 99? Yeah. Well, they'll be here, they'll be right. here. It's the, the, the mist of the morning is just settling on a few tents and, and, and motorhomes, I think. But the real sights are here. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to miss a thing. So you're ready to consume some more? Yeah. You know what I came up with last night was that if I eat a donut and I consume it, how much of it is left? No, believe mm, me, it gets mm, consumed mm. very quickly. Mm. But then I thought of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well, mm. where he said, if you drink my water, you will never thirst again. Mm, mm, and if we mm. consume this here, we will, we will never empty that. Amen, we'll amen. This, and I'm encouraged mm. by that. Mm, mm. Sometimes mm. I feel empty in life, and it's nice to be mm. reminded that, that I'm not. So... Mm. Why don't you bow your heads with me as together we come before God again, shall we? Let's pray. Dear God, we ask you again to be with us. Uh, fill us uh, with your word here today. And may an outpouring of your love and your spirit come through us onto this campsite today and into our families. Mm, mm. So again, give us alert minds, open ears, open minds to hear mm, your will mm. for us today. Bless Bill again as he presents, bring the right stories, the, the right mm, information, mm, the right mm. questions to mind, that we will together draw around you today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, you. Thank you very much. Well, someone moved this back when I wasn't looking. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Another vigorous morning in the Word, huh? Eh? This is going to be our best morning so far because what is emerging this morning is the real root of Adventism. You may be still asleep, but I'm not. <laughs> mm. So I'm going to repeat that statement again because it's always good to at least convince yourself that you're not in a morgue. <laughs> that there are visible signs of life around, isn't it? So what's going to come through this morning is the essential root of Adventism. Amen. The reason why God reached down to this earth for only the third time in 6,000 years and raised up a movement. We're getting very close now to the reason for that coming through. It's taken us all the week to reach this point, but the question that came out yesterday as we concluded, and I know some of you have spent a restless night thinking through and several people have mentioned to me that they've wrestled with this during the night season I say praise God you know we should be wrestling with these things shouldn't we yeah. it's healthy to re-examine our roots and I look at the fervor and the power of the early Advent movement and the enthusiasm and the all-night sessions as they studied and prayed and tried to get clarity of scripture. I long for those days again, you know. Yeah. And we're getting a little taste of it here with the enthusiasm and the commitment of people just to dig in and to hear it for themselves. So the sanctuary, the only message in scripture that has the complete plan of redemption in it. And the question you were left with yesterday, which we're now beginning with this morning, 
And I meant to tell you yesterday, but I forgot to add this uh, interesting little detail. But uh, when you give an answer this morning, you will need to support it biblically. Just a little extra detail there, you know. Because <laughs> if you were thinking anything less than that, then I have failed you miserably this week, okay? So the question that was on the table when we concluded yesterday... Good to see Pastor Marlon here this morning. He has the habit of popping up at the most propitious moments. <laughs> he has deliberately done this. <laughs> the question that was on the table yesterday. What barrier between God and man was Jesus meeting here? And what barrier between God and man was Jesus addressing here? And what barrier between God and man was Jesus addressing here? This is the biggest question of the week. And it all has to do with what sin has done to the human race because Jesus came to undo what sin had done to the human race. Amen. How do I handle this? She's writing. <laughs> oh, now they're writing. This is an even better excuse. Okay. But I thought women were multitaskers. <laughs> I see, but not speak. Okay. Okay. Somebody has asked me this morning to give a New Guinea story and we probably can't fit it in today but we may try and squeeze it in at the end of the meeting tomorrow. If you've all got passing grades, we'll do that. You know? <laughs> that's what I've been asked for the tree story. Yes, I don't know why that's such a popular story. So Jesus came to undo what sin has done to the human race. I praise God every day, by the way, that God is a God of restoration. Amen. I know it's beautiful that we see him as a loving and forgiving God. That is absolutely essential. But I'm like the Apostle Paul, there's something that's much more than that. Yes. He is offering restoration to the human race, no matter what sin may have done to you. Amen. We are in trouble this morning. Okay. I'm going to repeat that statement again because I'm not satisfied with the level of vitality here. I shouldn't have to work so hard to get a response to a statement like that. So I'm praising God that God is a loving and forgiving God but with the Apostle Paul I am into the much more belief that there's something much more than just forgiving us. And the much more has to do with being totally restored. Amen. So that I'm not spending my entire life as a slave to sin. Amen. And if we can't be freed from slavery to sin, then the good news is not good news. How's your faith this morning? Great. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, through his death... Jesus has addressed some things that were barriers between sinful man and a holy God. Now as you respond to this, we, we do need scripture. So I'm going to give you two minutes this morning. These are not prophetic minutes either. <laughs> two minutes this morning to make sure you've got a biblical support for what you're about to share with me. So go ahead. 
and make sure you've got the scripture nailed down to support your contribution. What were the barriers between God and man that caused Jesus Christ to offer himself as a sacrifice? He was addressing certain barriers between God and man. Feel free to communicate with one another this morning. Oh, well, I'm not taking answers yet. And I never respond unless the person is communicating with somebody else. So please get yourself a partner or two. You can turn around if you like. These two look ready to embrace you here. Oh, someone's even moving up next to you. Look at this. Well, hmm. Where's your partner? You've disowned him. I don't know. We miss his vibrancy, yeah? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a half a person today. <laughs> Let me give you a clue here. Listen carefully. <laughs> Listen carefully. If you can find a scripture that mentions the atoning death of Jesus on one hand and some benefit on the other, that will give us a clue as to what he's actually removing through his death. And there are many verses. Some of these you dug out the other day. You've probably got a list of them sitting there in front of you because many of you, I notice, may not have become Pharisees yet, but you're certainly scribes, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can you two see the board from here? Let's move you up a little, huh? This guy needs a partner. We'll even move your chair for you if you like. Here. We're very obliging here. He's chased his partner away, so we, we need to refresh this. Oh, look at this. They're independent young women. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't blame you for wanting a better chair. Those other chairs are terrible. <laughs> they do keep the saints awake, though. <laughs> Speak of the, uh, <laughs> speak of, hey man, good, always good to see you. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> mm. We were just giving your partner some additional partners in case you had been raptured or something. You know? <laughs> that would have been a good thing. <laughs> So I'm looking for scripture, I'm looking for scripture that mentions the death of Jesus in some way, uses one of those loaded words, blood, sacrifice, offering, a reference to the death of Jesus and at the same time a benefit 
coming from the death of Jesus which will help us to know what barriers Jesus has taken away through his death. Are you ready to respond to me? Okay, let's get some feedback, please. Now, I never take a hand of anyone sitting alone. You need to know that. So if you haven't communicated, you will not be heard this morning. I'm serious. We have a hand over here, okay? Thank you. Listen. Shh. Well, what an auspicious beginning to be looking in Romans chapter 5, okay? Verses 8 through 11. Romans 5, verses 8 through 11, okay? Um, now, we're only looking for one point from you, not the whole enchilada. I know, but others would like to jump into this too. So, give us one profound point. You've got half a dozen possibilities here. All right, I'm going to look at verse 11. Listen, shh, shh, shh. You're going to look at verse 11, okay, skip over the big ones, then go to verse 11, okay. <laughs> and, and, not, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Um, I believe condemnation is something that... No, but it's not in the verse. You have not proved your point. Okay, skipping on to the next person. Make sure you've got scripture that supports your point. Down the front here, okay. Listen carefully now, listen carefully. Don't give me an answer from omission. That means you're, you're arguing from something that's not in the scripture. I want an argument from something that is in the scripture. We'll come back to you because you had some big guns there. You could have boomed. Okay, down here. I'm in um, Revelation 1. Stand up and deliver. They can't hear you. Listen carefully. Um, Revelation 1. Revelation 1 has come out. Oh, hallelujah. We'll pray for you. Okay. Okay. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for I feel like that has all three of them in it. <laughs> now we only want you to make one point. Okay, so the first one Stand up again and make one point, please. Okay. So it frees us from the barrier of our sins. Is that how it reads there? It, it reads, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And I have very bad news for you. <laughs> the freeing from sins. Listen. Whenever you're dealing with sins, you're in here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This deals with sin. sin. This deals with sins. So inadvertently, you've actually helped us a great deal because you've saved some others from a mortifying death too. You know? <laughs> So remind yourselves that this is the area where sin is addressed. This is the area where sins are addressed. So we're, And even though you intended this well, the word sins has given it away for you. Because through his death, Jesus is not addressing our sins, but he's addressing something to do with sin, which is freeing us up so that he can now ad address our sins. Is that, that was a hand that kind of looked tentative at first, but oh, it's up finally, okay. Listen carefully. This is Romans 5.10. Someone has jumped back into Romans 5 again, okay. Okay, read verse 10 to us. Shh. The word reconciled, and I did give you the freedom, if a word was used, to look at the other side of that word. I've given that freedom this morning. So I'm waiting for your answer. The question is, what barrier has Jesus broken down through his atoning death? Listen. We were enemies to God. 
We were, we were separated from God. Now we we're being reconciled by the... All right, very good. Thank you very much. So we were separated. <laughs> separated. We were separated from God. Sin brought about a separation from God. And the death of Jesus has offered us reconciliation. It's a very good beginning here, yes. Reconciliation through his death. Very, very good beginning. A strong beginning. On the front, oh, let's go to the other side here for a minute, okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians... 5, 21. Oh wow, what a great verse, huh? my favourite verse. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.21, let's hear it, please. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Second Corinthians 5.21. So you haven't answered the question yet, I'm waiting for your answer. That that he made Jesus to take our sins so we could have the righteousness of God. Back. Okay, so you've, you've got from here to here now yeah. coming through. But specifically in terms of his death. I'm trying to make a distinction between his death and his life at the moment so we get it crystal clear. I know they overlap. And it's a beautiful sanctuary verse here because he became sin so that we might become. All of a sudden you start hearing Paul and you say, wow, this is a sanctuary statement. He became sin so that we might become holy. You're looking from the courtyard to the holy place now. But I'm limiting you to the courtyard for a moment, so let's get your answer with a degree of specificity. That's one of my favourite words, specificity. Hmm. Using the same verse, limit yourself to the courtyard for a minute. This is obviously a seminary level challenge I've thrown out here. You know? George, always good to see you, man. Praise the My Lord. Eh? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hang on. So we're going to have to broaden this. Who's coming to his aid here? You can see that you have a lot of... Beverly's raised her hand back there. Okay. Listen. The courtyard is where shh, 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 shh. <clears throat> the sins of the person transferred to the to the lamb, and then the lamb was slain. So pluck it out of the verse for him here, for Philip, would you? He's on the edge of his seat here, begging <laughs> for assistance. He needs a good Samaritan this morning. <laughs> So come on, Beverly, make a point for us now that we can put in here. Not here, but here. What, what would you like me to write down here? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. You notice how carefully she said that. She avoided saying sins, but she used the word sin. Philip, pick up on that and make a clear statement for us. This will be very cathartic for you. <laughs> um, that I'm just, I just want you to echo what Beverly just said, just for reinforcement. I understand. Um, in the courtyard is where Jesus became sin. sin for us. So the implication is what was separating us from God was sin, yes. It's simply, it's that, it's that simple here with the text that you've read. Sin was the big separator between us and God. And Jesus in his death actually became sin 
for us. He accepted the responsibility for what sin had brought upon the human race. And the only thing that's come out so far is separate. Oh, I've spelt it wrong again. <laughs> Separ There's an A in there. Separated. The only thing that separated us from God was sin. And so Jesus took away that barrier by becoming sin. This is why he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I wish you could have been with me when that young practicing homosexual recently responded to the picture of Jesus that I was giving him and I pointed out to him that Jesus was crying out my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me? and I said it's because he had changed his name to your name Amen. God saw you hanging on the cross in the person of Jesus it's not the first time I've used this question on a young practicing homosexual, and it still works. I said to this young man just recently, what must God have seen when he looked at his own son hanging on the cross? It was something so bad that God basically said, let him die. What must God have seen? And this young man who saw it immediately said, wow, God would have had to have seen a young, practicing homosexual who's lived in sin for 15 years of his life. I said, that's exactly what God saw. Mm -hmm. Jesus became sin for you. I said, Jesus himself had no sin, but he permitted himself to become you in the sight of his father. It was your death that he was dying. And this kid just fell down on his knees and wept and wept and wept. He said, I had no idea that God loved me that much. I said, none of us do. Jesus became sin. This is the beautiful understanding of justification. What an exchange that is. His perfect robe placed on me. So God looks at me as though I'm perfect forever. We studied that. While Jesus took on my likeness and took it to death so that I might be freed up now to become the righteousness of God in me. Wow. Okay, we've got a hand here. Could it be also in Titus 3 where it says... Titus 3 what? Um, 6. 3, 6? Okay, let's hear it. Whom he poured out on us on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs. Yes, yeah, so it's a similar thought, isn't it? That we are, because sin had uh, disowned, God, you know, we're being disowned because of sin. Yes. So he restored us into his kingship as his sons. And so God. Jesus justified us, because what condition were we in? Sin. Under sin. That's why he justified us. We were under sin. In the sight of God, we were impure, unholy, totally under sin. So Jesus became sin, thus making it possible for God now to declare us. This is the declaration of righteousness. He declared us to be righteous. Would Romans uh, 5.9 go right under that? Well, Romans 5, 9 says the same thing, just using slightly different language. Unless you can pluck out a different point from it, can you? Read out Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from <coughs> wrath through him. Um, what that tells me is that uh, we're being justified by his blood, and he took, the, he took our death. Um, yes, that's saving yes, us yes. from the death that he took at the cross. No, no, not at all. Whenever you get into saved, oh. we're saved by his life. life. Even though the whole Christian world says Jesus died to save me, it's not biblically a true statement. Jesus died to justify me. He died to reconcile me. He died to extend forgiveness to me. 
But saved, he moves us now into here. We're saved by his life. They're so closely tied together, I hate to separate them, but Paul's the one who separated them here in Romans 5, 9 and 10, just so we would get it clear. There's several more big things yet. Oh, she's come back to life again down the front here. Thank you, God. Okay, jump up again, would you, so they can actually see you. We know you like getting on your feet. Yeah, so. for sure. <laughs> um, I was just looking there at Romans 5, um, 9. No, wait, sorry. Um, That's the verse he just read. Oh, yeah. Romans 5, 6. Okay. You see at just the right time. Listen, listen. Powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just, I, I don't know, I like that, the powerless, how sin makes us powerless. We have nothing. So, we were powerless. We were, what's the other word there? Ungodly. ungodly. We were powerless and ungodly. And again, uh, it's a little repetitive, but it's okay. Because it's bringing in a, a new aspect. We were powerless and ungodly. And how did Jesus rescue us from that? You're going to give us a whole statement here? Or half a sandwich? Christ died for us. So, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even in this state, in this state specifically actually, is when Christ died is when God gave us Christ to die for us. So what did Jesus actually accomplish through his death? Um, he gave us power to connect. If you've given power, you've moved into here. I, I hate to keep doing this, but I'm trying to get you all to see that this is something that God does for us. We're not involved in this except by faith. This is something that God does in us. Listen. He demonstrated his love in doing that. It's a demonstration of love, okay. But how did Jesus, uh, how did he remove this barrier between us and God? With, by dying. Yeah, but you haven't spelled that out yet. Um, Christ died for the ungodly. Yes, but I'm wondering how he did that just by dying. Okay. Listen, listen. You can draw on your team here if you like. Uh, they're like one team here now. It's formidable. So he, he freed us because he lived a perfect life? Or he became sin. All right. So this is an interesting... Uh, he, we could say back to going back to the same... But who, who blurted that out? That was Jane the Baptist. Who was that? Uh, <laughs> oh, back here. Okay, yes. You could use the same verse again. He became sin. But I like where you're heading with this. He lived a perfect life. And what did he do with that life? Oh, he, he, he exchanged it for ours. He offered it in exchange for ours. Amen. The incredible good news this morning is that Jesus has been accepted by God as, as us. Jesus has been accepted by God as us. Jesus has been accepted by God as us. I was wondering how many times I'd have to say it before the saints showed signs of life. I'm having chills. She's having chills down here. This is an incredible thing. Jesus has been accepted by God as me. I can hardly handle that. He was perfect and holy, as you've pointed out. And God has accepted Jesus in my place. So my imperfection, my unholiness, my powerlessness, were all placed on him. And in exchange, his magnificent, holy, perfect life has been placed on me. 
By the way, if you're putting on that robe every day, you may actually grow into it. It might fit you in the end. It might just fit you if you're putting it on every day. Because when you first put it on, it doesn't fit you that way. You say, oh, this is not me. And God says, I know, I know. But trust me, I'm going to grow you into it. This is a beautiful thing coming through here. We're talking again about justification from another perspective. It's the least appreciated benefit of the atoning death of Jesus. We should be praising him every day by coming to the cross and seeing Jesus there and saying, wow, thank you, Father, because you accepted him as me. Amen. There's a saying I use over and over again, if it's happened to Jesus, it's happened to me. If something has happened to Jesus, God considers that it's happened to me because he has accepted Jesus in my stead. Amen. Especially to resolve what sin has done for us. Emma, was that a slight movement there? Very slight, but I, I notice these things because I've been expecting you to come back to life again. Okay. I'm thinking another point that Jesus okay. addressed in the court as our second death. Hang on, one minute here. Jesus... Jesus' holiness is credited to us. That's how he resolved that. He offered a holy life to God in exchange for our unholy lives. Amen. And God has accepted that and given us the credit now for his holy life. I stand amazed every day of my life that God sees me as perfect again today. He sees me as just in his sight, not because I'm getting a little more holy, but because he has accepted Jesus as me. It's overwhelming to me. We should get chills on this. We should. All right, Emma, this is a great point. Go ahead and bring it out, please. What were we under through sin? Oh, the second death you said a minute ago. The second death. We were definitely under, no one's brought out condemnation yet, interestingly enough, but I'll, I'll hopefully somebody will have that ready. But the second death, we were definitely under a death sentence. The wages of sin death. is death. We were placed under a death sentence. And it wasn't the sleep of death. This was a permanent death. Because sin cannot continue to live in the presence of God. Amen. I don't know how long it took me to realize that if I'm choosing to hang on to sin in my life, I won't be doing it in the presence of God. Therefore, I have to conclude God is planning to root it out of me. That's in here. All right, Emma, give us your scripture now, lest we perish. Stand up, would you, so we can catch this. Romans 6, you said in verse? Verse 5. 5, okay. All right. It's not a bad thought. I'm not sure you. it's convincing me yet of the point that you've made, however. What about six? What about the verse six? Yeah. Six is Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Isn't all that more part of the holy place? Not yet, no. no. The lifting of the death sentence is definitely not in the holy place. It's in the courtyard. But Emma hasn't given us the biggest gun of all yet. Come on, Emma. Listen. So we're getting closer now. My old man, my old nature was crucified with him. Amen. If you just read on another couple of verses, we might have the whole enchilada. Go to verse 8. Hang on, hang on, she skipped over that rather quickly. Let us hear an emphasis on the right syllable now. <laughs> Let's have it again with emphasis. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, if we be dead, and the big thing that I'd like to see you emphasize is with Christ. 
We died in Christ. His death was our death to sin. Just, just by way of comparison, read John 5, 24. Would you just uh, to have a little comparison? Now, these are powerful verses coming through, by the way. The second death has been lifted from us because Jesus died our death. Listen, yes. You've passed from? Death. You've gone through death. Someone said to me recently, aren't you concerned about hellfire and the second death? I said, not at all. I've been there and done that. <laughs> I've already died the second death Amen. in him. So the only thing left is the first death, which is nothing. Amen. It's only a sleep. Amen. But the second death is the big one. Yes. And we've already died it in Christ. Could God have been any more generous to us than that? There's somebody sitting out there now with uh, condemnation or judgment popping up now. We'd like these verses to come out. Oh, you've had one slice of the pie already. It was a pretty crazy slice, I have to admit. Um, Anyone else got some? Oh, hallelujah, your influence is spreading, Philip. This is good. Okay. Uh, this is in Romans 3. Romans 3. Uh, starting in verse 25. Takes a lot of courage to get into Romans 3. Okay. Yeah. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this, did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left and submitted beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So the two loaded words that I was hoping to hear have somehow eluded us. I was hoping to hear a reference to condemnation and judgment. Now this is a great verse but I can't let it slip in yet because this other question's on the table. Back here, what have you got? Romans 5.18 Listen So make your point <laughs> well, you've read the scripture rather well, but whether you've got it is another matter. Go ahead and make a point, please. I'm not sure we got both words in there. We got one at least. Huh? Listen, listen, see if he's actually making a point here. Yes, if it said that, I'd be praising God. It doesn't actually say that. I would like you to produce a scripture that does say that. That would be even greater, you know, because the thought is excellent. You paraphrase the, the second half of the verse, unfortunately. But do you have scripture that's actually saying that? <laughs> You've done very well. What are you adding to this? Romans 8. Oh, well, someone jumped into <laughs> Romans 8. Hallelujah. The big condemnation passage. Okay. Let's see if she's hearing it now, though. Romans 8 verses. 1 and 2. Well, now, if you're going to end at 2, then you should start praying for deliverance. Uh-oh. I'll go to You have to... Oh, <laughs> such wisdom is uncommon. She's decided to include 3. How wise that is. Okay, read verses 1 through 3 for us, please. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, now let's all make sure we've got that. If you're in Christ, you are not condemned. condemned. Okay, now let's see if she's got this clear now. Go on. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I hope you're not reading the word law there as the Ten Commandments. 
Some people foolishly do that. This is the law of what? The law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of? Sin and death. Amen. Keep reading. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So let's see if she's actually hearing now verse 3. Eh? Well, we could not... We could not... Um, why is there no condemnation to us if we're in Christ? This is verse 3 now, it's on the line. God, God, Listen. God conquered sin. He did what we could not do in the flesh. In the you have not brought condemnation into your answer here. That's a little scary to me. We're talking about why are we not under condemnation if we're in Christ. First of all, because Christ conquered sin, but... Come on, give me the whole answer now, please. Listen very carefully. We, this is her moment in the sun. As an offering for sin, he took our place. Just leave out the essential words and you'll see me jumping up and down here. He condemned sin in the flesh. Come on, show me that you're hearing that statement, please. This is Paul, he's tricky. Well, as he became sin, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay, you're still skipping over the essential <laughs> part here. The last part of verse 3 is on the line now. Give her a moment now, she's doing very well. She's processing Paul on the spot, imagine that. Amen. That's a huge accomplishment to be able to do this. Listen. The last phrase there. He oh. Sin in the flesh. Amen. He Listen. Sin. He conquered sin in the flesh. It is the last phrase that you haven't commented on yet. Oh. You want me to rephrase that? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Such wisdom is uncommon, oh, you know. It actually says he conquered sin in the flesh. Or not he conquered, he condemned the word condemnation coming in here. He condemns sin in the flesh. That's what you're not hearing yet. Come on, that'll push, this will push us over the edge here. Go back to the beginning of verse 3. Read it to yourself again. Then the last phrase hopefully will kick into you. I could ask you one little question that would... Oh, she's, she's praying now that I will ask her. This is wonderful. Listen carefully. I'm going, to, I'm going to suggest to you the question. In whose flesh? Listen. He condemns sin in the flesh. Now be very careful. Go back to the beginning of verse 3 and read it again. It's easy to miss this. I missed this myself for years, so I have great compassion for you at this moment. Mm God did something, sending his own son. He became flesh. He became a man. He became God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh. sinful flesh. 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 Condemned sin uh -huh. in the flesh. So, Listen. Wow. This is, I know, this, I know I this is a wow moment here. And I know I had the wow experience myself. I said, ah! Oh, God condemns sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ. God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
He condemns sin in the flesh. Nothing would be accomplished by condemning us. We were already under condemnation. But God did the unthinkable. He took our condemnation and did what with it? Did what with it? Shout it out, would you? He put it on Christ. Jesus took our condemnation upon himself. That's why there is no condemnation if you are in Christ. Because he has already borne your condemnation. By the way, the other word for condemnation in Greek, it's the same word as judgment. Some versions read judgment here. Jesus took our judgment, our condemnation upon himself. Henry, yeah. Well, it looks to me like Paul is saying. Speak up a little. Looks like Paul is saying that God condemned Christ. That's right. He condemned sin in Christ. Thank you, Henry, for that. Imagine that, by the way. Imagine that. That's why Jesus had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh. By the way, imagine if Jesus had messed up only once. We would have been denied the privilege of being freed from. Don't listen to the vultures around you. Thank you. Freed from condemnation. Yes. We would have remained condemned. But our condemnation, our judgment, <laughs> fell on Jesus. Amen. That's why Jesus says, by the way, if you believe, you will not come into judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, at the back there, is that Andy? Okay. Yes. yes. I would just like to offer, um, and this address the passage from Ellen White, as sort of a recapitulation of just the theme that I'm hearing here, of this, the central theme of substitution. Um, this comes from the book Desire of Ages, and um, it just kind of like a, it really kind of elucidates it in my mind. Um, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserved. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. It's a beautiful statement, isn't it? Yeah. What page was that? 25. 25. 25. Okay, yes, thank you for that. That is a powerful statement. All right, I'm moving from the courtyard. Jesus addressed all these things through his death, reconciling us to God, justifying us before God, taking our condemnation, our judgment upon himself, freeing us up now to receive his own life. That's why I said a minute ago, imagine if Jesus had messed up. Imagine, I'm moving on, I'm sorry. Imagine if Jesus had messed up in his own life. I want you to read something with me in Hebrews chapter 5. I'm not going back into the death again, we've left that now. We're moving into his life. Hebrews chapter 5. One of the most profound statements about the humanity of Jesus. Roman, uh, Hebrews chapter 5. By the way, much of Protestantism has a handle on what we just did. Maybe not all of it. I've discovered that justification is not always crystal clear. But Protestantism by and large has come to the cross. The significance of Adventism is what happens after the cross. Amen. That it's not the end of the journey, it's the beginning of the journey. Don't wave at me, I said we're not taking more comments on that, we're moving on. Because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Hebrews 5, listen very carefully. Verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying, and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety, that's his holiness. Although he was a son, notice the next statement, he learned. learned. 
Some people think that Jesus was automatically holy and had a perfect character. Jesus was as human as you and me. Amen. Character is not something that you inherit. You can certainly inherit the tendency towards a certain type of character, but it comes from learned behaviour. Jesus learned obedience from what? The things which he suffered. And having been made perfect. Are you hearing that? He wasn't instantly perfect. He was made perfect from the things that he learned through suffering. In other words, Jesus developed a holy character. I hope that's hitting you this morning. Because he was as human as you are, Jesus had to develop a character that would glorify his Father. Think of that. Think if he had not managed to develop this character. The whole ministry of the holy place would have been thrown out. Because in the holy place we are offered the perfect life of Christ is imparted to us daily. Here at the courtyard, it's the righteousness of Jesus 100% credited to us. Here in the holy place, it's the righteousness of Jesus 100% now imparted to us. The holiness of Jesus credited to us here is now made available to our daily lives. We touched on this yesterday, the eating of the bread, which was actually the eating of his flesh and drinking his blood, which was actually the work of the Holy Spirit, which ultimately was hearing and doing the, thank you very much, the word of God. That's an incredible message from Jesus, acting upon it. This is how the righteousness of Jesus is imparted to us daily. But the, the point I'm making is that all the way through the sanctuary, whether you're here, here, or here, it's 100% the righteousness of Jesus. And if I'm growing in holiness, it doesn't mean I'm going to need less of his righteousness. I need 100% the righteousness of Jesus every single day of my life. It's him in me is the hope of glory, is the holiness of God. It's him in me. So we're moving into a whole new arena here. What he's done for me is now followed by what he wants to do in me. And the good news is God plans to have a holy people. Amen. Great deep conviction here this morning. God plans to have a holy people. Amen. In fact, God needs a holy people. Amen. And the reason for that's going to become evident in here. God needs a holy people. Because the great controversy is not all about whether I make it to heaven or not. I used to think I was the centre of the great controversy. As long as I make it to heaven, that's what counts. That's what the whole controversy is all about. It's not. This is a controversy about the character of God. We're caught in the middle of this. And the interesting thing is... God needs us Amen. to demonstrate something about himself. Amen. We're getting there. So here we are now in the holy place. We've already been through the furnishings. We know it's all about consuming the very life of Christ himself through his word. I need scripture now here. If you're responding... What is Jesus addressing in the holy place? What has sin done to the human race 
that Jesus is now addressing by making his life available daily through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John's got the first response. Hallelujah, John. Praise God for this resurrection.